Hi guys! So in my January wrap-up I said that my reading could only get better from there, or that's what the video title said anyway. And it did get better, but not before it got much, much worse, I'm afraid. So the first book that I read in February was The Brief History of the Dead by Kevin Brockmeyer. This, I think, is supposed to be speculative fiction. The premise is that the dead live on in a sort of afterlife as long as there is somebody left alive who remembers them. So when a super virus wipes out the whole world population in a matter of weeks, the dead start to vanish from the afterlife at a rate that has never before been seen in the afterlife, until there is only a very small number of people left who, as it soon turns out, are all connected to the same person, who happens to be the only person left alive on Earth, because she happens to be in one of the most remote and isolated places on the planet when the epidemic struck. All of this is not a spoiler, it is revealed more or less in the first two chapters, or even in the first chapter if you've read the blurb. And that was one of the problems of the book. There was no mystery, there's no suspense at all in the book. The second and graver problem is that the author doesn't do anything with a premise. You would expect there to be some kind of philosophical or spiritual question to be developed from that premise, but there isn't, and problems and inconsistencies aren't addressed either. For instance, all those people who are left in the afterlife when there is only that one person left on Earth are all people that that person could have remembered, but doesn't necessarily actively remember at all times, yet they are always there in the afterlife. So how does that work? Is it subconscious remembrance that's at work here, or how does a person's memory influence the afterlife exactly? This question isn't addressed and neither is anything else. I have no idea what this book was written for, to be honest, and I wouldn't know why anybody would want to pick it up. And my next dud, I'm afraid, was the wildly popular Tales of the City by Armistead Morpin. You know, when you see somebody new at work or at a sports club or something and they seem fresh and interesting at first because maybe they are wearing some kind of interesting bracelet or a band shirt or some item of clothing that attracts your attention and then you start talking to them and two minutes into the conversation you are so bored you want to shoot yourself. That is this book. This is a somewhat legendary book, the first in a series, and it supposedly celebrates this new liberal society that emerged in the 70s, and it does so by depicting the party scene of San Francisco in the 70s in a supposedly open and honest way. We, the reader, follow Mona, the sort of protagonist who is a young woman from some backwater country town, who comes to San Francisco on a visit and in a spur of the moment decision decides to stay there permanently and we then follow her as she tries to find her bearings and carve out a life for herself in the city and while she does so she meets all kinds of supposedly weird and eccentric and sometimes somewhat shady but always lovable quirky characters, supposedly. So I was prepared for this book to be somewhat frivolous and to feel like a soap opera, both because of its episodic character and because of the, um, the intellectual depth, shall we say. But what I was not prepared for was the complete and utter vacuousness of the stories as well as of the characters. All they were ever doing was talking about where they would hang out that night in order to hook up with the next disappointing asshole who, shockingly, would turn out not to be the love of their lives either, just like the asshole of the night before. Shocker. And none of the characters were in any way quirky or even just weird either. They were just your average dudes and ditzes. 
And if, if that had been ironic, it would have been one thing, but it wasn't. And if you don't find this sort of vapid and cardboardy characters charming, then there is very little humor to be found in this book. But it is apparently, or it was apparently, in all earnestness, supposed to celebrate this great new revelatory city lifestyle and, you know, freedom. And I can't help but think, well, this is one huge damn waste of freedom right here. You are all such complete nothings, you might as well have stayed repressed. And, you know, if I want to listen to the same inane conversation repeated endlessly, I would just take off my headphones in the student cafeteria. So... Although I haven't read them, I'm quite sure that Christopher Isherwood's Berlin stories are the better and fresher alternative to Tales of the City, even though they are half a century older. I really wouldn't bother with this one. But it did get better after that. Sorry, I had to change the light because the weather forecast was wrong and it's not cloudy after all. I hope this doesn't wreck the focus, but there's nothing I can do at this point. Sorry. So... It got better after Tales of the City. After that, I read a book about a different but comparable time, comparable in the way that it was also in many areas of life and for many people a time that was dominated by a spirit of liberalism and a feeling of societal progress. I'm talking about the jazz age and the book is Whistling in the Dark by Tamara Allen. This is a historical novel with a romance or a love story at its center, and it's set in New York City in 1919, so just before the Prohibition and at the very beginning of the Jazz Age. Sutton Albright is the son of a wealthy factory owner from Topeka, but he has had his life turned upside down. He is wounded in the war, and that puts an end to his aspirations to study music at the conservatory and become a concert pianist. And he is then expelled from the college where he went to instead for scandalous behavior. So now he has come to New York City to start fresh, only he has no money and no plan whatsoever. Jack Bailey has lost his parents to influenza while he was in the trenches and his friends were only just able to keep their novelty shop open and running until Jack's return. However, the shop continues to run badly and Jack is just scraping by and has had to borrow money from shady moneylenders and now gets harassed by the moneylenders' minions all the time. And all he really wants to do is tinker with his radio and maybe even have his own radio show if only his shop assistant were a better pianist. And on top of it all, he is suffering from PTSD, although of course it is not called PTSD in the book, that would be anachronistic. And this PTSD is giving him by turns insomnia and nightmares for which he self-medicates with alcohol and by finding ever new and more exciting ways to keep himself busy. And he tries to compensate by putting on a cheery face and cracking jokes all the time, but he is basically a half breath away from the breaking point. So it is a stroke of luck for both Sutton and Jack when Sutton, the stranded concert pianist, moves in next door to Jack, the wannabe radio show host. This is a very sweet romance, but with the very serious undertones of the impact that the Great War had on people's minds and how they were left to cope with them or to not cope with them as it happened on their own. It is as much a story about found family as it is a love story. It has a great ensemble of very vividly painted and somewhat eccentric and very lovable characters and there is even a crocodile. And while the events that are depicted are quite dramatic and stressful for the people involved, the story is still very low-key and a very quiet and character-driven one. It is very evocative of the time and place, and I kept thinking that I would love to see this made into a movie. It would have a great soundtrack, too. By the way, this is not a steamy romance. It is, however, a very well-written one. The author has a great style and a somewhat peculiar style, which sometimes forces you to backtrack and read a sentence or a paragraph again. And I like it when that happens. 
And, and this is why I called it a historical novel with a romance at its center and not a historical romance, because I feel like calling it the letter would put it in the same category as this pulp by Kat Sebastian and KJ Charles, if that's her name, that I read recently. And this is a very different beast altogether. I liked it so much that I thought, oh, I should really read more books of this kind set in the Jazz Age in New York City or maybe New Orleans. But I couldn't immediately find any that appealed to me. There was just a lot of femme fantale stuff, which is not really my thing. I did, however, find a lot of books that deal with the aftermath of World War I. So now I, I somehow maneuvered myself into a World War I rut. Uh, this is not at all what I would have thought would happen at the beginning of February, but here we are. I am at the moment reading The Lie by Helen Dunmore, which is about a young man who comes home from France to England. He is discharged from service and has next to nothing and no one to build a life back in Cornwall. And all the while his mind is still in the trenches and with one very important person that he lost there. And I've also started to read Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, which I didn't know was so much about the aftermath of the First World War. And I'm currently waiting for a book to be delivered by Susan Hill, a novel called Strange Meeting, which is actually set in the trenches. And I figured while I'm waiting for that one, and after I've finished The Lie, this would be the perfect moment to finally pick up all Quiet on the Western Front by Erich Maria Remarque, only in my edition, of course, it is called Im Westen Nichts Neues, because this is supposedly the greatest war novel ever written, and now there's really no excuse for me to not have read it. So that is my small World War I excursion. World War I is a topic that we don't learn that much about in school. We at least when I was at school. We learn a lot about the end of the war and how the end and the peace treaty impacted German and world politics in the following decades. But World War I as such is not or didn't used to be a big topic at school. So it is time that I made up for that. But back to the wrap-up. I also read Winter Count by Barry Lopez in February. This is a slim volume of short fiction by the author of the Pulitzer or National Book Award winning non-fiction book Arctic Dreams. These very short short stories are all about man's relationship with and attitudes towards the natural world. Usually the protagonist in these stories tries and succeeds or half succeeds and often fails to connect with the natural world or to communicate his connection or his attitude towards the natural world and towards talking about the natural world and towards talking about other people's approaches to the natural world. These stories are almost all realist, but they all contain an element of wonder. They are all very quiet and understated stories, and their power creeps up on you, and it goes unnoticed for most of the story, and it's only at the very end of each story that you go, oh, and you realize what the story was all about. I adored the book. The only small problem that I had with it, which m more amused me than it frustrated me was that the protagonists of almost all the stories are all of the entitled white male kind and they get access to and get invited to places and to people's homes and um, start conversations with people to which I would never get access and they get themselves in situations that I could never get myself into. There is one story in particular which is in which the protagonist, it's an encounter with a protagonist and a woman. It's not a sexual encounter, it's more like a meeting of souls, if you like. The protagonist and the woman 
bond over a shared passion for a natural phenomenon. But the way the encounter was written, you could just tell that it was written by a dude and it would never have played out that way if it had been written by a woman. So, but like I said, this is more a source of amusement <laughs> than of frustration. And this is a very short read, as you can see, it's a very slim book. And I would recommend this to anybody who has an hour or two of free time at their hand. And there is only one book left to talk about, which was a buddy read between me and Shannon from That's So Po. We decided to tackle Solaris by Stanislav Lem, which is a Polish science fiction classic from the 1960s. This book is set in a future in which space exploration is well underway and is an international endeavor. In this story, the protagonist is a psychiatrist who gets sent to a research station above this planet Solaris, which is covered in a huge ocean, which is really an undefinable biomass so an alien entity and this alien entity has a history of making manifest the researchers deepest most private thoughts and memories and sending those manifestations to them in the case of our protagonist it is the manifestation takes the form of the protagonist's long dead ex-girlfriend who committed suicide because he left her all of this, of course, doesn't go down well with the humans who fail to recognize the aliens' endeavors for what they are, namely attempts at communicating and at establishing a connection and at understanding the humans. <laughs> this is kind of spoilery, but I knew most of this going into it, so I must have read it in some blurb on Goodreads or somewhere. And anyway, all of this is established in the first few chapters in a huge info dump, including the message, which is humans are self-involved and they are oblivious to minds and kinds of consciousness that are different from their own. So far, so good. The problem is that the book then falls prey to the same problematic behavior. With the form of the protagonist's ex-girlfriend, which is of course only a canvas for the thoughts of the protagonist, the alien entity gets reduced to a simpering idiot of a non-person, and we are then subjected to 200 pages of relationship drama between the protagonist and himself. I kept waiting for a sign that this sad irony was deliberate, but I didn't get any apart from this one comment about human obliviousness. It might be that I was too in fear from that one comment that it was meant this way and that I was supposed to give the author the benefit of the doubt and to just assume that he meant it this way implicitly. The thing is, implicit doesn't really cut it here. If you write 300, or let's say 200, because the first third is info dump, if you write 200 vacuous pages about a self-involved, self-aggrandizing dude bro without giving him any counterpoint at all, then you will have written 200 vacuous pages about a self-aggrandizing dude bro and nothing else. Especially if you even give the dude bro a tragic hero ending. So implicit really just doesn't cut it here. But apart from all those problems, the story didn't work for me on a very basic plot level either. There were two major objections that I had. The first is that the story hinges on the premise that the research, research station is completely isolated from Earth and, and all other human beings. And it is isolated because the technology that is described in this is more or less at the level that it was at in the 1960s. So communication is cumbersome or nearly impossible. And I don't, 
I don't think that space exploration like this could happen if we don't figure out the communication problem, especially not with communication at a level that it was at in the 60s. And it doesn't seem to be a deliberate choice either. It just seems to be the limits of the author's imagination, sad as it is. And the second premise that I didn't buy is that a group of scientifically and psychologically trained cosmonauts will crumble to pieces as a group as well as individually at the first sign of emotional turmoil. Yes, these manifestations are embarrassing, but still, these people underwent 16 months of specialized training. And on top of that, it has been known for decades, if not centuries, that the ocean wreaks havoc with people's minds. So how does that make sense that people crumble to pieces more or less as soon as they set foot in the research station and see one of their manifestations. I just don't believe it. I think that people, these people, these cosmonauts would have been able to put all that aside and say, okay, this is embarrassing, but we've been trained for this. We know what to do. So yeah, more than anything, this book has been a reminder of why I usually stay away from classic Golden Age SF. There are just too many problems with these books. Fortunately for me, Shannon had more or less the same problems with the story. I'll link the video where she talks about it below. In fact, she only listened to the BBC radio adaptation of the book and then decided that she didn't want to bother with the book. A decision that I supported wholeheartedly. I'm sorry that I'm ending this video on such a negative note, but that's how you know me and how you love me, right? <laughs> Bye.